Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 10th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the New Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the current state of play as of showtime Tuesday morning about the PFD, including the statement by the administration and House State Affairs last week that they no longer back the current statutory PFD. We should add that the state of play changed Wednesday morning after the show when the governor announced his support for a revised version of SJR 6. We discussed that development further on a special episode of the Michael Duke show devoted to that issue on Friday, which is available on the show's Facebook and Spotify pages. We also will discuss it further in our segment on next week's show. Second, we discuss the current incomplete state of play surrounding the budget and where we think it goes from here. And third, we identify our biggest surprise of this session, and it's a disappointing one. And now, let's join Michael. We're actually going to dive into a discussion from this last week's PFD, where the governor said, no thanks to putting the statutory PFD in the Constitution. My head is going to explode. Brad Keithley. Um, welcome to the program, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, my head, uh, my head did, uh, did almost, uh, as well. Uh, it happened over on the house side. There was a hearing, uh, before house state affairs, I think, uh, is where it was. Um, and they were considering SJR six, which is the governor's, uh, constitutional approach, uh, to the PFD. It, the governor's constitutional approach this year really doesn't set a PFD. What it does is set up a constitutional provision that says uh, abide by what's in the statute, and then it's and then it has a companion bill that's the statute that sets uh, that sets the PFD am amount uh, uh, on a on an ongoing basis, uh, and then if you want to amend the statute, uh, you have to get 50% uh, of the votes in the in the in, in both bodies to get the governor to sign it. Uh, and then it goes out to the people for ratification. It's a very complicated formula. Um, Sarah Vance, to her credit, uh, tried to cut through all of the, all of the, uh, uh, all of the verbiage in it uh, and all of the, uh, and take out all of the risk that's in it. I think there's a big amount of risk by using a statute in the way that the amendment proposes uh, and just try to cut to the chase and, and change uh, the bill to essentially uh, replicate uh, SJR 1, Senator Wilikowski's uh, proposed constitutional amendment that provides that the PFD will be the greater of the current statutory, what's in the current statute um, uh, and, and brings the current statute into the constitution, the greater of the current statute or POMV 5050, which has been uh, sort of the, the alternate proposal that's been out there uh, for a while. Um, and so here's here's the amendment that Sarah proposes in front of House State Affairs, um, and and the governor's and and it's to you know do away with the governor's amendment, essentially go straight to the core of it, uh, higher of uh, current statute or or POMV 5050, and Mike Barnhill, who is representing the administration, uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner of Revenue, Mike Barnhill, who's representing the Dunleavy administration, essentially says no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I'm sorry. I appreciate that idea, but you know that's not really what we want. What? Right. What? I, it, it says you know that the that the that the current statute takes too much uh, out of the POMV draw. The administration supports the PO, the the 
POMV draw. Takes too much out of the POMV draw. Doesn't leave enough uh, enough left for government. And so, no, the administration doesn't support the amendment. Essentially, backing away from what I understood, and I think what a lot of others understood, uh, Governor Dunleavy campaigned on in 2018, which was to pay the PFD to to to, to follow the law, to to uh, follow the the current statute. Essentially, uh, backing away from the from. Uh, any uh, administration support of uh, of the current statute. So that's that's sort of how last week landed, and it was um, shocking. I mean, I it, it, the the whole the whole Dunleavy proposed constitutional amendment this this session has been bizarre. I mean, to we know what troubles we have with statutes in this state, right? We know we know right. the the lack right. of deference they're given by the by the Supreme Court when they deal with with fiscal matters and to and to tie the PFD into the it, 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 through, through a statute into the Constitution through a statute, I think it's just a huge risk. Uh, but then to not even support the current statute uh, as the as the amount that would be tied into the Constitution uh, was just uh, was just uh, shocking. I, I I I can't believe the Dunleavy administration backed away from that. Right. So, well, and, and again, uh, I think just to, to 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 do the double hammer blow on what you're talking about, this was like one of the major things that he ran on. I mean, this was it. This was the whole thing. He said, uh, "We're going to pay your PFD, your full PFD. Oh, and we're going to pay your back PFD." This, you know, what they just shot down doesn't even pull doesn't even pay the full PFD. It's insane. Yeah, and and the and the and the really, I mean, this just got way twisted uh, as it as it went through the committee process. So at the end of the so, so at the end of this at the end of this hearing, there's a vote on whether uh, to advance the governor's proposed constitutional amendment uh, to the next committee, and and all the Democrats, all the majority vote for it, <laughs> and and Sarah Vance and I think it was David Eastman, yeah, Eastman. was the yeah was the other other one on the committee voted against it <laughs> so you got you got the two republicans the two hardcore republicans <laughs> voting against the governor's uh, proposed pfd and all the democrats uh, democrats voting for it i it it's just i mean my comment after was okay well dunleavy's a one term and done governor right who, who, who who's going to be next i i don't know how he explains this when, when he gets out when he gets out on the campaign trail again and when he when he you know talks to people i don't know how he explains this. I mean, the only way to explain it is to say, well, you know, they wouldn't cut spending. I tried cutting spending in 2019. They wouldn't cut spending. So, you know, I had to back up and we have we have these spending levels now and we got to pay for it. And uh, the only way I've come up with paying for it uh, is is by cutting the PFD. And that's, <laughs> you know, tell me what the difference is between between that Mike Dunleavy and Bill Walker. <laughs> t- right. T- exactly. T- 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 tell me. Tell me what's changed then uh, uh, in the Dunleavy administration. Anyway. Well- that that was last week. Uh, this week, uh, it's it. There's a couple of things on the PFD that are important, both of which are up for hearing today uh, in House Ways and Means. Uh, one is uh, a proposal that Kelly Merrick uh, put out there last week. Um, sort of has the tacit, and since since Merrick's co-chair of House Finance, sort of has the tacit um, imprimatur of the House Majority. Uh, and that is to restate the PFD, uh, to, to restructure the PFD so that it's no longer a percent of permanent fund earnings, <coughs> excuse me, no longer a percent of permanent fund earnings, but becomes a percent of of royalties and um, rents and royalties and other mineral payments made to the state, not including production taxes. Those aren't included, just mineral rents and royalties. Uh, 30% of mineral rents and royalties. And that's a bill that's very similar to a bill that Liesl McGuire surfaced back in the early 20 teens uh, to, to switch the basis for the, uh, for the PFD. Every, every time I hear about this proposal, I think of the old uh, uh, shell game, right? Where you put a P under one of the shells and you switch right. them all around. And, right. Three card money. Uh, right. All right. Three card money. Uh, right. And so you, you're, you're, we're to the point where, you know, 
well, the, the, the permanent fund is getting big. The permanent fund earnings are getting big. Ooh, we don't want to pay the PFD off that. So let's switch it to this other thing that's, well, that's yeah. declining. Well, and this is the same thing that Bill Walker talked about when he wanted to create a sovereign wealth fund. Then he was going to pay Alaskans based on the amount of royalty or the amount of, uh, of oil that flowed through the pipe every year instead of the three-year rolling average, excuse me, the five-year rolling average of the permanent fund earnings, which again, it all points back to what you just said. All of a sudden, the permanent fund is huge. All of a sudden, the earnings reserve is huge. They're making a lot more money, and they realize they have to pay that out to Alaskans, and they just can't let that money out of their hands. I was uh, the the funny thing is I this so so Kelly Merrick proposed this, and at the same time, the proposal uh, that Ways and Means had made in the committee bill to just pay five hundred dollars this year uh, and sort of it, just make that a one year payment and go on um, that that, that five hundred. <laughs> Excuse me, that five hundred dollar bill got withdrawn, um, and the Kelly Merrick bill uh, suddenly became the the focus. Well, I was doing some work over the weekend, and guess what? Guess what? This formula works out to be when you when you take thirty percent of the rents and royalties, uh, et cetera. It turns out to be five hundred dollars. <laughs> And, and but it's not only five hundred dollars this year when you when you look at the projections as we did uh, over the weekend and when you look at the projections of where rents and royalties are going, it stays around five hundred dollars uh, 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 out into the future. So what would it's it's a back end. I mean, they, they will make all sorts of noise about how oh we're trying to tie it to the state's resource wealth and isn't this what Governor Hammond intended originally and. And isn't, you know, isn't it the right thing to do to tie Alaskans to their resources and the development of their resources? Won't it make Alaskans support resource development more? No, it's just a back end way of getting to $500. Right. You know, you can sort of see through, see through the, the, the the curtain and and understand exactly what they're doing when you do when you do those projections and you you put together this graphic which I posted up on the Facebook uh, on the video right now folks can go back and watch it or they can go to your Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and find it but it is telling the graphic to me is like the most telling thing to say look. This is where the current statute would put us. This is where the POMV 5050 would put us. And all the way down at the bottom, this little orange bar, this is where Kelly Merrick's PFD would put us. And it's just so telling that this is exactly it. They cannot stand to see that money get out of their grasp. And that's what this is all about. We're, we're going to hear all sorts of things at today's hearing about how this is really a great bill because it ties Alaskans to to resource development. But, you know, just take all that with a grain of salt. It's a bill that they that they backed into figuring out a percentage that would give them five hundred dollars. That's that's all it is. I mean, they they might as well say it's the five hundred dollar PFD bill uh, escalated out over time. The second thing that's up before uh, House Ways and Means today uh, is is to me uh, a very interesting bill. It's House Bill 37, Adam w Adam Wolves' bill, it contains two pieces. Uh, one is to set the P reset the PFD, uh, and the second is to adopt a flat tax, a, a, a modified version of a flat tax. It isn't it isn't absolutely a pure flat tax. Um, the PFD portion is wrong. Uh, I, I disagree with it. It's a uh, 20% uh, of of POMV. It's a it's a POMV based uh, PFD, and it's it's 20% of PO of POMV. Um, and the flat tax, uh, I think, is a little bit wrong because it really doesn't run flat. It uh, it it turns up to be a little bit progressive uh, uh, the way they've the way they've structured it. But it's a it's a it's an alternative to the Merrick approach. Of re of completely restructuring the PFD and tying it to something else uh, other than the permanent fund earnings. So it's going to be an interesting it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, session today before Ways and Means, and interesting to see how those two uh, bills play out uh, going forward. They are now the lead bills, I would say, on the POMV uh, on the House side. The Senate side uh, has still has SJR. Well, SJR six is still progressing on the House side too, but it's not going to go much further. Uh, SJR six is is stuck in Senate Judiciary unless it got out yesterday. Um, is uh, the governor's proposed PFD amendment uh, and SJR one Senator Willikowski's bill, which I think is a is a good approach. Just, let's just put the the uh, PFD in the in the Constitution. SJR one uh, because it's a Democrat's bill isn't going anyplace. Right. Uh, it got it got through its first committee and then just sort of disappeared. 
So um, I would say this House, the, I would say the House Ways and Means, the hearing today before House Ways and Means, will be an interesting hearing to see uh, to see what direction the PFD is going from here. Before we dive into the budget <clears throat> as number two, let me revisit for just a second and uh, and extrapolate on this PFD issue. Um, it's looking like right now that all that any PFD discussion is going to end up uh, running into the extra session. Uh, now, based on what just happened with Dunleavy and his administration saying thanks but no thanks to the full PFD, what are the possibilities that the governor calls a special session to deal specifically with the PFD since it's in neither bill, since it's in neither the House bill nor the Senate bill? The Senate has said they want to have a separate vote on it. The House kind of alluded to that. What do you think actually happened since we're basically out of time? Well, if if the if the if the two bodies uh, adjourn or reach the end without having a PFD bill, then there is no PFD next year. And I think the governor, I think the governor will call them back into session uh, to focus focus on the PFD. Uh, I don't think he's going to. I I would be shocked. Uh, I mean, my head would explode in ten thousand directions. Um, uh, if he if he let the the legislature die without uh, without having any PFD, so if that's where they get to at the end of the session, uh, and and if that's and if they want a special session, that's where they will get to. Uh, if they get to the end of the session that uh, that there's no PFD bill, uh, then I think the governor will call him back at least for that. Brad, I mean, I just I, I guess I I just got to say. I can't even wrap my brain out of where the governor's coming from um, on this. I mean, this is a guy that ran specifically on crime, budget, and the PFD, and not necessarily in that order. Uh, crime has pretty much been taken care of with the SB91 rewrite, so he spent the last two years focusing on the budget and the PFD. He's made a lot of noise. He's talked about how he wanted to, I mean, as, as far back as, what, only I think five or six months ago, he was talking about how he really wanted to pay the full PFD and the back PFD, and here he's handed a golden opportunity to to enshrine in the uh, to enshrine in this uh, uh, constitutional amendment the idea of paying the full PFD or the fifty fifty POMV whichever is greater, and he blinked and said no 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 that's not real that was how nice of you but no thank you what is going on Michael I think it's this I, I think I think the governor uh, has decided he's not going to be able to cut spending I think after the twenty nineteen experience. Uh, he's decided he's not going to be able to cut spending. So if you can't cut spending, if you're not going to cut spending, you've got to fill the deficit somehow. And there's two ways, two main ways to fill the deficit. One is either by diverting the PFD, the, a PFD tax, diverting the PFD to, to, to make up the deficit or to raise substitute revenues, um, in my view, a more equitable uh, set of revenues, but to raise substitute, substitute, substitute revenues to substitute uh, in for PFD cuts and fill the hole that way. In all honesty, and, and, and you know, Ryan McKee from, uh, from the Koch organization, the Americans for Prosperity, I think it is, said way the heck back, and I sort of, this sort of stuck in the back of my brain, said way the heck back, uh, we're going to get to a point, essentially said, we're going to get to a point where it's going to be a decision between taxes or PFD cuts. And, and at the time, Ryan said, uh, I don't think this governor is going to go for taxes. Um, and so, and, and, and we had the usual debate about, well, PFD cuts are taxes and all that sort of stuff. But, but I think we've gotten to the point where if the governor's not going to cut spending, we are down to the point where we're either going to do uh, PFD cuts, or we're going to do substitute revenues. And I think the governor's decided he's not going to do substitute revenues. Uh, that that he that he doesn't want to be the one that goes out there and breaks the mold uh, and comes up uh, with substitute revenues. So I think I think what they've come to is the only way they can fill the hole. If they're not going to cut spending, if they're not going to do substitute revenues. The only way they're going to be able to do this is through PFD cuts. And I and I think I, I think that's what motivated the exchange that occurred. Uh, uh, last week uh, uh, between Mike and Mike Barnhill and uh, Sarah Vance. It's, um, I mean, instead of not being the governor that went with taxes, he's going to be the governor that basically puts the bullet in the head of the PFD. I mean, that's essentially what it comes down to at this point. So I guess you got to decide where you want to leave your legacy, but uh, 
wow is all I can say. Just just freaking wow at this point. Um, I agree with your assessment. One and done. I think that uh, I think that he has broken faith with his voter base one too many times. If he does not come out on this in a, in some way that's stronger and, and better. I just don't see how this is this is going to go anywhere. And he, at this point, he has to call a special session. Now, my question is, if he calls a special session, he's the one that could set the agenda. Does he limit the agenda to some kind of leftover PFD, or does I mean, can he can he, is he going to put those kind of strictures on it, or what is he going to do? I mean, it's the only it would be the only saving grace for him at this point. Yeah, the administration, this administration has not wanted to step up and make decisions. I mean, ever since 2019, ever since the the, the showdown of 2019 over those spending cuts, this administration has not wanted to make decisions. So I, my guess is in that situation, he would make a broad call about the PFD and try to push the burden off on the legislature so everybody blamed the legislature for whatever whatever came out. But I mean, this exchange with Sarah Vance, this this committee exchange, I think, you know, forever. <laughs> that that's going to be that's going to be the clip that uh, that that opponents go back to uh, in uh, in next year's uh, next year's election race because uh, it's just I mean that's it. He had the chance. Say it. Say it straightforwardly. Say yes, Sarah. We agree with your amendment. Um, and and they just didn't. Uh, in fact, they said, well, we can't do that. Uh, because uh, because that would take uh, too much money out of the POMV for uh, for the PFD. So, I, uh, but but to answer your question, I think he goes broad in in the call uh, to try to push as much responsibility back over on the legislature. He's just not a, he's not just not wanted to stand up uh, on these issues. Uh, Harold says Dunleavy made the political mistake one at one. He overpromised and underdelivered. Look, I I would if the governor just continued to fight, if he continued to push the full PFD, if he continued to take every opportunity to do this, I think that there would be no fight over this. I I quite honestly think that people would support him on that, even if the legislature didn't. Give us a tease for number two, the budget. Give me the highs and lows real quick here before we go. We're going to talk a little bit about. Um, uh, where the Senate is on the budget, uh, where the House uh, ended up yesterday, uh, and then the 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 role that the uh, Amer- uh, American Relief Plan uh, uh, funds, the federal funds, are playing in all this, and how and how that's going to go forward uh, over the next uh, over the next few days. We're about to jump back into this now, and of course, it is all about the budget right now. It's all about that base that. Uh, that big budget base, and uh, Brad is going to give us some analysis, both of the Senate and, of course, of the recently passed bill from the House yesterday. Uh, Brad Keithley uh, joins us now. Number two of the weekly top three, Brad. Well, we've got two incomplete budgets. <laughs> uh, we've got the House budget that passed yesterday, but during the course of the debate, uh, the federal government came out with guidance on the ARP funds, uh, and and limited the use of ARP funds to states like Alaska, uh, states with with less than a, a two percent uh, change in unemployment uh, during the COVID spike, um, came out and and limited uh, the ARP funds to states like Alaska to 500, basically 500 million this year, uh, and 500 million next year, half and half. Uh, over spread over over two years, the House budget uh, that passed yesterday uh, included 700 million uh, in ARP funds. Some of which uh, was used to backfill spending to create space for a PFD in the in the House budget, uh, as we've discussed on the show before. Uh, another portion of which was used to pay for new things uh, that uh, that that weren't covered by. Uh, uh, things that aren't covered by the current budget uh, didn't didn't use it to backfill, and my sense is that those were split roughly half and half. Um, so you've got uh, the House has passed a budget that spent 700 million in those funds. You're not you're only going to have 500 million uh, in those funds. So the so the House is is over by about 200 million, uh, and is going to have to something's going to have to be done with that. So it's an incomplete budget on the House side. 
on the Senate side. Well, and, been be, and, be, and before you jump into that, I will sure. make a point that I did not make earlier. They attempted to make a CBR draw vote, which would have allowed them to draw. There's not much left in the CBR. There's a few hundred million dollars. They would have been able to draw that two hundred million out of the CBR to cover that, but that vote failed. Uh, only 24 yeses. They need 30 yeses to make it happen. That vote failed, so they can't go to the CBR to draw that. So yeah, and the CBR, the CBR is it used to be hugely important to to get to pull savings out of there to support the budget. It still still serves that purpose, but the big part of the CBR vote anymore is the is the reverse sweep. Right. Uh, so the so they voted against the reverse, essentially voted against the reverse sweep. Also, that's. That's a, that's another sort of half done thing then uh, that comes in off the House side. On the Senate side, while the House uh, had been figuring out how they were going to you know proceed on the budget after their problem of a week ago, um, the Senate's been working on their operating budget. Uh, have been working on an operating budget, um, and last week uh, had a presentation uh, on the operating budget that didn't use any ARP funds. Uh, Tried not to use any uh, uh, savings. Tried to use. Uh, tried to, uh, you know, pay for UGF with UGF funds to show what the budget this year, the, the true budget this year, uh, and more importantly, the true budget going forward uh, would be. And and they came and and that budget showed about 4.5 uh, for about a 4.5 billion dollar budget. Uh, oper- <coughs> excuse me, operating. Um, and I think they had some capital in there, uh, budget, and showed that the budget about balanced with a zero PFD. Right, right. <laughs> if you diverted, if you diverted all of the all of the PFD, uh, and taxed all of the PFD into support spending, that the budget would uh, would just about balance. So, um, that that's where that's where the Senate is, and that's an incomplete budget because they don't have the they don't have the PFD. It didn't rely that budget doesn't rely on ARP funds. But it didn't have the PFD in it, so it, it was basically a, a a look at this budget. See, you know, everybody, look look at this. If we pay everything that we have promised to pay to everybody else, uh, except the Alaska, except Alaska families with the PFD, if we pay what we've promised to everybody else, uh, we can balance the budget. We don't have any left over to pay to Alaska families like we promised, but 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 we can balance the budget. Um, and now that the House has passed its incomplete budget. Uh, it'll come over to the Senate side, uh, and the Senate's basically going to have to, you know, put Humpty Dumpty together. It's going to have to take what the House did, deal with the fact that the House, that the ARP funds uh, that the House is relying on are short, um, uh, deal with with uh, with with the budget that the Senate's been looking at, uh, and deal with the PFD issue, uh, and come up with something. There were some very encouraging words. There's a Matt Buxton column. Um, that's uh, the, normally Matt Buxton's columns are uh, uh, are behind a paywall, but the, the ones on Monday and Friday aren't. And there was a Matt Buxton column on Friday uh, that did a great job, sort of summarizing some statements made um, in the Senate. And 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 one of the comments made by Lyman Hoffman was just was particularly good uh, in talking about the PFD. Lyman said that the PFD is important. That uh, that it the, the budget currently does include a PFD, but but it's his intent uh, uh, to have a PFD uh, in there. And then he made a comment that uh, I wish I could have seen uh, Natasha's face when Lyman made this comment. He said, "Those who those who uh, to paraphrase, those who say that we don't have enough money for a PFD uh, are just are framing the issue." Uh, in their favor, he said, "You know, you could just as easily say that we're going to that we're going to pay the PFD, um, and that and that school funding is what causes us to have uh, causes us to go over budget. I mean, it's it's it 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 depends on what you put as the marginal spend, and those who have claimed that the PFD is the uh, is the marginal spend are just doing that in order to um, in order to position themselves or frame themselves." Or frame the PFD as a as the thing that needs to be cut. That's that's exactly what Natasha's done over the last what several years, last four years. She's always phrased framed the PFD as the marginal spend. So the first thing to be cut, the thing that the thing that uh, the thing that the, that the PFD is the thing that's causing the uh, 
causing uh, the deficit. Right. Um, and, 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 and Lyman did a great job uh, reframing that. So I, the, the Senate, um, as it takes up the budget this week, uh, I think we'll be taking up the PFD as well. And, uh, and I think it's important to look at Lyman, uh, 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 Bill Wilikowski, who's been a staunch PFD defender, uh, David Wilson uh, from the Valley, who's on that committee and has been, who said he's a PFD defender, Donnie Olson, who's been a PFD defender. It'll be interesting to see how the Senate Finance Committee you know, deals with reality, deals with these two half budgets that are out there, tries to make them into a real budget and deals with the PFD. Yeah, and and again, as we look at this and we see this, uh, this is all about prioritization, and and that was a part of what Sarah was attempting to do before was again put the PFD as the priority uh, over everything else, which again I think it has been up until Walker's term. The PFD was not even on the table. It was not even, and I think people don't understand that. I think the average person doesn't understand how they used to account for it. It was never money that came in and out. It was a simple transfer. It was outside of the discussion. The PFD transfer happened, and then the budget debate began. So I think that that's what people are missing here is that all of a sudden it's become the political hot potato that people want to kick around. And, of course, it's the juicy target that they want to take the money out of. People like Natasha and others want to make happen. Yep, that reframing happened in 2017. I, I can find the ledge finance sheet uh, where it happened, and it was Natasha uh, and and Anna McKinnon and uh, a couple of others that uh, of the of the finance committee chairs who were involved, and David Teal from Ledge Finance were involved in making that decision. They took they took the PFD out of essentially the DGF category, the designated funds category, and put it into the UGF. Uh, undesignated fun, or, or, or un, un, uh, uh, unrestricted de- uh, general funds. funds. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's an interesting point. Uh, we're down to number three, and I do want to mention this before we uh, before we end wind up things here. And number three is basically the thing that we haven't seen all session. What haven't we seen all session, Brad? We haven't seen any effort to revise the formula programs. I mean, there were a lot of people who talked about going into the session, we're going to hit spending, we're going to look at these formula programs, we're going to revise the formula programs, we're going to bring them down. And I haven't seen any effort either on the House side or on the Senate side, the Republican-controlled Senate side, to look at these programs. Indeed, yesterday, the Senate Education Committee, which would be the place that would look at K-12, through the K-12 through formula, the Senate Education Committee said they're not going to hold any more sessions. Uh, uh, the remainder, not any more meetings, the, re- the remainder of the session. They just sort of gave up. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really surprised that we haven't seen any effort on either side to look at the formula programs. Of course, the administration hasn't either. They haven't come up with any proposed uh, major changes to the formula programs. But I thought, I thought this session we would see some effort at looking at the formula programs, and I'm not only surprised, but I'm disappointed that we haven't that that, that hasn't happened. And that's a that's a huge component of the hundred and fifty million dollar increase that happens every year. I mean, there's if nothing else changes and everything is static, the budget goes up hundred and fifty million dollars a year, and of course over ten years now you're talking about real money, and that of course is a huge component of a lot of the automatic escalators that are built into these formulas. Less than a minute here. Well, yeah, it's it's the it's the two big programs. K through 12 is a formula program, and Medicaid is a, a, a formula program. Those are two big drivers, the two biggest drivers uh, of the budget. And not to look at them, not to go into them, not to deal with them, um, uh, means you know means that legislators are giving up on trying to control spending uh, as well. Right. Well, it just seems like that there's not a whole lot of interest in controlling spending, uh, especially uh, for the Democrats and the majorities. They just kind of want to continue on business as usual, and they wish we'd just shut up about it. This is the crying shame, Brad, is that I think you're seeing it, is that not all legislators, I think that there's a core in there that want to continue to fight over the, uh, uh, you know, over the uh, the cuts in the budget. But there's just, there's, there's some Republicans in there who just, they kind of throw their hands up and be like, well, we just can't really do anything so why i mean it's almost like why bother it's like why even attempt to try and fix this and then of course we saw on the house side the crossover of steve thompson and bart lebon on voting for the uh on voting for the budget um and and maybe it wouldn't have mattered maybe at that point it didn't matter when it was all said and done but i think it shows uh i think it shows the intent 
when uh, when everything's finished. I think it shows where their heads were at when it was uh, when it was all said and done. And that to me is uh, is the most frustrating part. Yeah, and you you know I I'm I'm sure if Kevin McCabe's on here, I'm sure he's he's going to say that, that he would have pursued uh, the minority would have pursued looking at uh, uh, looking at the the formula programs, and if they ever get in the majority, they will pursue looking at the formula programs, all of which is good. But over on the Senate side, we had a Republican majority, right? You have Peter Machicki as as uh, as as president of the Senate. You have Republican committee chairs. Uh, uh, Roger Holland, who defeated Kathy Giesel on the, you know, on the platform of I'm going to get spending down, uh, uh, chair of uh, Senate Education, uh, and you and 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 I've not seen any effort, and I've been looking for it. I've not seen any effort uh, on the Senate side to look into these formula programs and try to uh, try to get them under control. So um, I think that you know I, I, everybody talks a good game. About and and you know the governor talked a good game when he when he was running for election. Everybody talks a good game during their campaigns about getting spending under control and I'm going to get down there and I'm going to you know look through these look through it and I'm going to look through the process and I'm going to look at these formulas and I'm going to but then nobody does it when they when when they get there. Uh, I'll give a pass to the House minority; they weren't in control of the committees, but the Senate majority was in control of the committees. They could have set the agenda. They could have said on day one, we're looking at these formula programs with an eye to make significant changes to them. Didn't happen. Right. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I just don't, I just don't see um, the motivation uh, or the action that's going, that, that, that's going to happen. That's going to, that's going to change the spending side. And that, you know, that leads us back to our prior discussion then. Well, if you don't change the spending side, what happens on the revenue side? And you get down to the ultimate choice of PFD cuts or substitute revenues. Um, and I think we're beginning to see people, you know, what people are going to do. I, uh, we've seen, you know, Kelly Merrick wants to restructure the PFD. We've seen, you know, Adam Wool wants to cut the PFD. We've seen the governor refusing to back up the statutory PFD. So I think I think we're seeing people saying, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have PFD cuts to fund at least a portion of this, and as we've talked on the program before, that that is outrageous because it has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and on the Alaska overall Alaska economy of all the options. We are picking the worst option uh, to to fill the uh, fill the defi deficit gaps. Uh, Chris in the chat room says, look at the composition of Senate finance, and uh, that should be your sign right there. Uh, and, I mean, I that was my first thought when this, this new Senate majority got put together and it was a caucus of equals and they were trying to bring everybody to the table. But to bring everybody to the table, what did you have to do? You had to put the same batch of people in charge of Senate finance, the most powerful committee in the Senate, and you had to put, uh, you know, Bert Stedman and Click Bishop and Natasha and all those people back into that. I mean, and that's it. You, you pretty much signed. I mean, that, that is your sign of things to come right there. It, it is, but but you know, education could have, and and HHR David Wilson's committee uh, in the Senate could have could have made a, you know, a stink about it. They could have said, here are cuts we can make by revising the formula, and sort of put finance on the hot seat uh, to address to address those formula changes. And maybe finance wouldn't have done it, but you had people in those committees that have jurisdiction over the formulas that could have driven toward formula changes and they didn't do it it's uh it's disappointing to say the least brad we got about a minute and a half here i want to give you the final bite of the apple well the final bite of the apple is watch what's going on on the fd um uh we may lapse back into just one year one uh, another one year fix but there are some serious efforts being made on the house side at least to restructure the pfd uh, on a permanent basis going forward, as I say, the Merrick bill to to sort of back into a $500 uh, uh, PFD, a huge PFD cut um, uh, on the on the House side. So watch what's going on. If you, if you really are concerned about this issue, watch what's going on in uh, House Ways and Means uh, this week uh, in uh, in dealing uh, dealing with those bills. 
Uh, the Alaskan people may have to take things into their own hands, Brad. I mean, at some point, we may have to try and put some kind of thing on the ballot to basically have the Alaskans vote on how they want the PFD distributed. I mean, that it, it, it's an expensive, it's a painful, it's a long and drawn out process, but it seems like it's the only solution left to us because politicians have continually failed us and they continue to do so no matter what they say. Yep, and Michael, that will be an expensive. I mean, the 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 pro PFD forces would will ha- have to raise money to be able to do that because there will be a lot of money coming in from the top twenty percent and others, the oil industry, for example, to fight that ballot. Because if you don't, if 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 the PFD gets enshrined, then they're going to have to pay right uh, to cover the deficit. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, my friend, thank you so much, as always. Michael, as always, thanks for having me on. My head is going to explode, my friend. All right, we'll talk with you later. Thank you so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.